you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text upon which we base our meditation today is John's Gospel, uh, the ninth chapter, and I'm going to look at all 41 verses this morning. Some of those were read and there's pieces missing if you want to follow along on the Gospel. But at this moment, I'm just going to read the last verse 39. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. This is God's Word. So whose fault is it? It's the Chinese. I don't know what kind of emails you get, but I even got an email from somebody who used to be a broker for me, and I've since departed ways from my working with him, but he sent me the one where... The center of Wuhan is where Chinese government has been doing the weapon development and also the virus development to attack the rest of the world, and one of them got out. And there's really already 37,000 dead people in Wuhan and a bunch of other things. And, but the stock that you used to invest in is going to help cause the cure for that. So keep investing in cytodyne because books will be written about this someday. wait and see. <laughs> I didn't know whether to take it seriously or not. Um, I'm waiting for the books to see. I've watched that stock. It hasn't really gone anywhere yet, but it hasn't gone down, so must something must be happening. It's the one stock that I own that hasn't gone down. In Jesus' day, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? That's how they thought in those days. I don't know if this was all cultures, but in Israelite Jewish culture, if this person had this problem, God did it to him for some reason. Might have been that person's fault, might have been the parents' fault, and it was passed on to their children because that's how God worked. Especially among the Pharisees. Pharisees thought, if you do what's right, God will bless you. I mean, they took some logic out of the Old Testament for that because God did tell Moses, you follow my ways, you have the people follow my ways, and I will bless you. And Isaiah was telling the people, you don't, didn't follow my ways, you haven't listened to me, so now I'm going to let you have these problems. So it wasn't really wrong for the Pharisees to come up with 2 plus 2 and come up with the logical answer of 4 except if you ignore many of the other Bible passages where God is a loving God, a merciful God, and he does not hold us accountable because of what Jesus has done for us, even with Adam and Eve with the first sin. That you will die if you eat of this fruit. We would normally interpret that immediately, like it was poison. But the dying culture did kick in. Adam did live 900 years before he finally dies and goes to heaven, but he does go to heaven. And he did kick in that aging process, which the human race has been suffering with ever since. That we're born, we get to our peak somewhere in our 20s, and then, oh, when is old? Is 30 old? I remember getting that as a t-shirt once. 30 is old if you're a tree. If 30 isn't old if you're a tree. Then 40s, then 50s, then 60s. And I know some of you say, though I'm going to turn 65 this year and I'm getting all my Medicare stuff already in the mail, keeping a nice pile of it. But you say, oh, you're not old yet. I said, well, thank you. Thank you. Got to get to be 70, 80, or like Marty was in her 90s when she passed away and joined her husband in heaven. And they're now enjoying the young life again in the glorified bodies. The Pharisees missed that up, but they so what they thought. And that's how they had built their club. You do what God says, you'll be blessed. And for some reason, since they also were businessmen, that seemed to work out for them. But it was always that problem too. If one of them had a big problem, then all of a sudden they got judgmental. They got judgmental and started thinking about what had that person done wrong? What had they done to, and then they would start pointing the fingers. So Jesus uses this man to teach us a whole bunch of different lessons today. And I'm going to go through this text a little bit of time and just point out certain things to remind myself of what I think God would want me to be thinking about since he bothered to record this whole story in the chapter 9 of John's Gospel. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? 
And who asked this? This isn't the Pharisees asking this question. This is the disciples. This is what they thought too. This is how they had been trained. A lot of things they had been raised with that weren't really correct, like the Messiah was going to come and conquer the world and lead us into glory, all of his followers. That's what Judas thought. That's why when Judas finally got the message that he has no earthly ambition, this Jesus. I'm going to be the treasure of nothing instead of the treasure of a glorious kingdom. I've been betrayed. Then he betrayed Jesus to sort of get him back. But then he saw Jesus in love doing all these things to save us. Realized he had made a bigger mistake. But unfortunately then Judas made his biggest mistake. He didn't think Jesus would forgive him. Because betray Peter betrayed him too by denying who he was. And he had a relationship and that was his friend. But Peter went out and cried and then knew Jesus could still forgive. Judas's biggest mistake was not the betrayal. Or even thinking that Jesus was going to start an earthly kingdom. His biggest mistake, that Jesus was not loving or forgiving. And so Jesus answers this by, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And I've had that before in a couple of texts already this year, that sometimes God uses us people. Now, I don't want to be one of those people. I even put in my prayers, help me teach about you, help me, but don't use me as an example. I'd like not to be used as an example. But he did that with different people and how he treated them, how he talked to them, but he still wanted to use them and knew their face was strong enough to handle it so that they and could teach lessons to other people and more people would be saved. Now this man isn't even a believer at this time yet. He's not a follower of Jesus as the Messiah, but he's going to use this man and his problem, his blindness, so that more people can learn the truth and more people end up knowing who Jesus is and end up in heaven. So after saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with a saliva and put it on the man's eyes. This one I like, because when I look at this and I say, how did Jesus take away somebody's blindness? With his powerful spit. Now with all the sanitizing stuff we have around today to try and make sure nobody you know, gets anybody else's stuff, Jesus on purpose is gross. He spits on the ground, makes some mud, and rubs it on the guy's eyes. Now if you were the blind man at that moment, what would you be thinking? Now you might not have seen that, but you heard the spit sound. And all of a sudden you feel this creamy stuff going on your eyelids. What's going on here? But when you read other miracles of Jesus, there's times he spit and grabs a man's tongue. There's times he looks up to heaven and gets Ephatha. And if you look at all the blind and the mute healings that Jesus does, just about every one of them is done differently. He doesn't have one method of healing people. He has a bunch of different methods. And I know, and I think you would know too, whoever is watching heard the story and said, this is how you heal somebody. Sort of like with the coronavirus or now, if you drink so much water every 15 minutes, you will flush it out of your system and you'll not get it. And if you hold your breath for a certain length of time, if you heard those on the news too, then you also you can't get the coronavirus. Can you imagine how many other people went and found a blind person, spit on the ground, put the mud on their eyes and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam, hoping that's what it would do, that it would heal these people? Or taking somebody and grabbing them by the tongue and saying, Ephatha, be opened? Oh, it didn't work. Must have done it wrong. And you and I know the truth. It's not the spit. It's not the special dirt in Jerusalem. And it certainly wasn't even the pool of Siloam. It was Jesus doing what he did. And people did figure that out. His neighbors, he goes home after he can see. So he washed and, and, and he went home. And his neighbors and those who had, and you don't have this in your text. This is why I like to fill this part in but I don't think they wanted to print the whole thing on the back of the bone. The print would be even smaller. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? So he had a cardboard sign. Take that for what I mean. Some claimed he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. So mass media in the days of Jesus was going a little nuts. But he himself insisted, I am the man. Well, then how were your eyes open? They asked. Well, he replied, the man Jesus 
made some mud, put it on my eyes, told me to go to Loam and wash. So I went, and then I can see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know. He said, he's still somewhere else. So they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. And now we pick up again now. The day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Oh, no. Jesus worked. Jesus worked on the Sabbath. That's a violation of the third commandment in Mosaic law. He had healed somebody on the Sabbath. That's bad. He had helped somebody see. That's bad because he had did it on the Sabbath. He had done it the day before, the day after. We do all give praise to Jesus, but since he decided to do it on the day of rest and he performed a miracle, now he's bad. So the Pharisees conclude and asked him how he had received his sight. And he says, I washed and now I see. And some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. So some people are judgmental. And yet I would ask the question, how hard was it for Jesus to do the miracle? How much did he have to strain? Squeeze the miracle out of his powers? Because in essence, what did he do? He spit. Can you spit on the Sabbath day? Can you make a little mud on the Sabbath day? Could you put salve on somebody's islands on the Sabbath day? Because otherwise, the guy did the work. He walked a great distance to get washed. I'm just joking with these stupid questions. This was important for them, though. But at least there were some people that were smart enough came back with the obvious question, how can a sinner perform such a sign? I mean, if he is a bad guy and he's violating God's law on purpose, how could he do this? Because you're not going to be able to do this unless God's working for you. So, but in their... Blind, their own blindness, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes to be opened. So they get him to give his opinion. The man replied, he's a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind. You couldn't have been blind. <laughs> your friends and family will say it, but you, you couldn't have been blind. So they still did not believe he had been blind and received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say? was born blind, so this is an alleged healing right now. An alleged person who got his sight back. How is it that now he can see? The parents are afraid. So their response is, we know he's our son. <laughs> we won't deny that. That, that. that is our son. And we know he was born blind. But how he can now see or who opened his eyes, we don't know that. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. And it does tell us his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. And that is why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So a second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. We know the truth. Don't contradict us. Don't confuse me with facts. And yet the blind man comes back with, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know that. I'm not going to judge whether that guy is a sinner or not by the way you judge who's a sinner or not a sinner. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How does he open your eyes? The answer, I told you already, and you do not listen. What do you want to, see? Why, what do you want to hear it again for? Do you want to become his disciples too? Oh, that, <laughs> that was a zinger. <laughs> that was a zinger to them. He answered. <laughs> so then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We're disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't know where he comes from. Tell me the Pharisees didn't know where Jesus came from. They just didn't like the answer. There was even somebody who ended up being a disciple had given that answer. What good can come out of Nazareth? And his brother Philip said to him, come and see. Come on, Nathaniel. You want to see for yourself? You don't believe me that he's the Messiah? You don't believe that guy Jesus from Nazareth? Come see for yourself. And Jesus said a few things to Nathaniel to help him understand. 
okay, you're somebody special. But he does the same thing, this blind man. Do you want to become his disciples too? No, 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 no. We don't even know where he comes from. Yeah, they knew. But they didn't like the answer. They didn't want to believe that a Messiah could come out of Nazareth of Galilee. So the man, he rubs it in a little bit by saying, the man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a blind man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. What a testimonial. What a testimonial for somebody who obviously he was grateful to. He's never been able to see. And now, objects, people, things, color. Talk about an awesome day for him in his life. I don't know what that would be like, because I've always been able to see. But to see for the first time and get it as a gift from Jesus, not afraid to make a testimonial. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And then we pick up what's on the back of the wall. And to this, they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. So their objective or not. They already made their minds up that Jesus was not the Messiah. He was not working with God. And no matter what evidence was put in front of their face, they were going to stay blind. Jesus heard the man had been thrown out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of God, Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked, tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus says, you have seen him. Now, in fact, he's the one speaking with you. And the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Did you ever see one of those faith healers on TV doing their thing? And what's their excuse if they can't heal somebody? Well, I can't heal this person because they don't have faith. Jesus can heal somebody who doesn't have faith. Heal somebody who doesn't even know he really is. He knew this guy was named was Jesus, and he had heard some things about Jesus, but he wasn't a believer at that time. He didn't have to have faith. Jesus can heal anybody. Faith or not, he can heal them and fix things and save. He didn't save us when, because we became believers. He saved us, and we believe that he saved us. And that's why when I think of what Jesus is trying to maybe think, make me think about today is the fact that he's blessed me with sight. Now, I don't take my regular sight for granted. I might not remember to say thank you every day to God, but I know my grandma was blind by the time she was 90. She still typed me letters in her typewriter. And she typed until the piece of paper fell out. Then she turned it over and she typed the other side. I think I've told you this story. Then she would take that to the lunch in the senior living center and she would have her friend read what she had typed. And then whatever was left out because the paper had fell, fallen out of the typewriter, she had that friend write in the end of that sentence. And then she flipped it over and that friend would read the other side and whatever, she, whatever had not been typed because the paper had fell out, she'd have her feet do that sentence. And then she would mail it to me to tell me what's going on in her life, even though she was blind. I've also told you the one time she must have had her right hand over one, one key. <laughs> so we had to interpret the letter. It was in code. Because <laughs> wherever, wherever the hand was supposed to be on the home row when you set it up, it was over one. So all the letters were off by one. So we had, it was a game. It was a game grandma sent me. My mother also dealt with macular degeneration and had to have the shots in the eyes so that she could see clearly. So if I live long enough, I sort of know in my future because I'm on that side of the family. And so I don't take that for granted. But what I take for most, most from this portion of God's word today is that God blessed me with the ability to see who he is and what he's done for me. And I don't want to take that for granted either. When I was with Joanne's mom on Friday, when she was still aware of certain things that were going on, I could ask her simple questions. What do you have your confidence in? 
Jesus keeps his promises. The vision that God blesses us with to see our future. Not clearly, I have no idea what heaven's all going to be like yet, but I know where I'm going because of what Jesus accomplished on that cross. He has helped you and me see that. To see who he proclaims to be. And we don't deny the basic truths about having a loving God. The people out there that have problems with that, unfortunately, we would, should still try and help them see that truth. In the Bethany Bible class, we've been going through some books, Prepared to Answer, and now we've been going through more Prepared to Answer. And all of these are just little four-page, five, six-page chapters that are trying to deal with things like, how can there be a good God when the world is such a bad place? There are many paths to God. Why should I believe in God? Isn't religion discredited by science? I can't handle your outdated view of sex. All these are blind excuses or little things that get in the way and create cataracts for people to see who the true God is. And maybe we can help them. Maybe we can help the people that are blind to who Jesus is and, and what he has done for us. Maybe we can help them see. Maybe we can learn about these different things in God's word and, and reach out to these people and help them with some of their blindness and some of their stigmatism and some of the other things. But first what I want to do, and I hope you do too, is thank God that he's given you the ability to see clearly. You are loved, you have a savior, and you're going to heaven because you see who Jesus is and what he's done for you. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.